Hello, everyone. Um, this is Ali Sierra Tan from thinkingandproductions.com. I wanted to chime in on uh, this whole conversation that suddenly exploded on the official news uh, because of this gentleman who's come forward and started to talk about uh, retrieval of UFOs uh, that have been crashing. Let's just let me actually go into share screen so that I can um, share we can we can travel together and all of this. Uh, it started with this uh, article that appeared inside of a technology, you know, minor magazine. Um, intelligence official says U.S. has retrieved craft of non-human origin. And uh, uh, um, oh, I just had a gap in my memory. Um, uh, Tucker Carlson. Um, who now has his show on Twitter, had his first show. And last time I checked, he had 20 million views. He only got three and a half on Fox. Uh, so he's doing better now. And uh, on that show, on that very first show he had, he was criticizing journalism. And he said, you know, for instance, there's this man who's come out with this information and it just has been uh, recorded in some minor tech newspaper why is it not i think on the first front page of the washington post or something why are journalists not going after this story he actually mentioned it that was kind of another place where it was mentioned and next thing you know you know the major news uh casts are talking about it you know suddenly this is my own twitter handle by the way if everyone follow me on twitter at ufos angels gods so suddenly you've got um, here they're talking about it, um, and I'll I'll show you this in a second. Uh, and Fox is talking about it. Uh, so you go down, you know, and there's uh, Fox is is talking about it, and I'll and I'll dig into what is being said. So it's kind of a, this explosion and. Oh, look, the word alien is trending on Twitter, 3,229 tweets. So it's like, you know, what is, what is, what is going on? I'm going to dig into this and the biblical perspective and what we've been saying since our documentary that you can watch at the top of this YouTube page. It's called UFOs, Angels, and Gods, and we released it in 2006. And the information has now really been confirmed, whether it's, the, the the key, the hermeneutical key that God gave us concerning the Elohim, the gods, or the gods of the nations, um, and uh, the relationship between them and the fallen angels. This this was very important. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 and all these ideas that have recently have become popular were in the documentary, as well as the idea that these chariots are not only connected to the world of fallen angels, but also is the world of the angels of God. I'm going to open that up for you. That's very controversial, but that's very important to understand. I'm going to open that up for you right now, because that's actually the topic of this talk. And the whole coming deception, you know, we have Dr. Chuck Missler and others who mentioned that perhaps we're headed towards this final deception, deception where the angels of God are cast as attacking aliens, and the angels that are behind the world leader the fallen angels are presented as good guys. And I'm going to talk about all of this with you right now. Uh, the, the the nations gather with the Antichrist, like it says in Psalm chapter 2, that the kings of the earth gather against the Messiah of God. And what would be the ruse? What would be the great lie? So the idea was that they had to do with this whole UFO phenomenon. And suddenly, you know, this we released this documentary in 2006, and it went absolutely viral. And many of these ideas, if not all the stuff that's in there, have, has been confirmed, whether it's the Queen of Heaven, whether it's the Altar of Zeus. I mean, we put so much information in there. And over the years, I've watched other people come and confirm, they agree in their own way that this, this is correct. So I, now that we're come to a new space, place it seems that after covid where things are changing and moving forward very fast i mean i can't believe uh, all the stuff that's happening whether it's you know the member of israel's parliament who recently said you know let's divide the temple mount which is a prophecy that most prophecy buffs have been waiting that there will be something like that about the temple mount uh whether it's the cern um particle accelerator suddenly there's news that they're about to 
you know, open a portal. And some people say that's related to the great pit in Revelation chapter nine, the Apollyon, that something comes out of the ground. Who knows? But there is so much happening in this UFO thing, which is going to be the focus of all of this. So let's let's dig into it right now together. Um, share sound. Okay. So it starts with this article that this gentleman, that it comes out, a former intelligence official turned whistleblower has given Congress and the intelligence community, Inspector General, extensive classified information about deeply covert programs that he says possesses retrieved intact and partially intact craft of non-human origin. So he's saying, look, they're picking up this stuff that's crashing, and they are um, back engineering it and, and building modern tech in the United States, and that there is, in fact, uh, alien bodies of, of, of dead pilots being retrieved. And even though the government has put a mild, you know, the thing in, out saying, no, no, we're, this is not true, but yet there's he's got incredible credentials, he's got incredible sources, and people have started to look into it. You know, here he is, David Charles Gersh, and he's got all of his medals, he's a highly decorated person, and he... The sources that he has, even though we don't know who they are, but apparently they're very, um, you know, top access to top secret. He, and he comes out and he starts to explain that this is what's going on. This is him. And these crafts are being, you know, found and all of that. Next thing you know, the official news starts to talk about it. Like, here's an interview with Quite him. Quite a number of them, and they are indeed of non-human origin. Those are the explosive allegations from a former intelligence officer tonight in a whistleblower complaint that the inspector general is taking very seriously. 36-year-old Air Force veteran David Grush is exposing what he calls a top-secret military program that has reportedly found wreckage of fully intact UFOs. The government now calls them UAPs, or Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. For years, there have been whispers and rumors that the government had aircraft of non-human origin. And so when you kind of go forward, you know, they have an interview with them or they show footage. News Nation's senior national correspondent Brian Enton is here with the story. News Nation's senior uh, correspondent. And, you know, he he says, look, we've vetted the guy and he's very clean and, and seems very reliable. And this is a blockbuster. It is a blockbuster. Recently renamed the All Domain Anomaly approached me. I have plenty of current and former senior intelligence officers that came to me, many of which I knew almost my whole career, that confided in me they were a part of a program. They named the program. I've never heard of it. And they, they told me, based on their oral testimony, um, and they provided me documents and other... So if you want to watch the whole thing, I mean, you can see it on my Twitter handle, UFOs, Angels, and Gods. But he's they interview him. This guy, but this is now official news, and he confirms yes, it's all true. And by the way, this whole idea of soft disclosure now I'm seeing that it has a pattern. Uh, there's a format to it. You know, someone who's trustworthy suddenly comes out and says something uh, very important, and the sources of the government don't deny it. They don't confirm it. They deny it very mildly. And they give the impression to the general public that, yes, there is something here to see folks. Um, and, uh, you know, then there's 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 other stuff. It all It's all coming out suddenly all at once, right? There There's exclusive uh, crashed UFO recovered by the U.S. military, distorted space and time, etc. Um, you, you've got... Fox, you know, chimes in. Uh, let's hear, listen to this for a second. Have corroborated to our next guest that the U.S. military is in possession of at least a dozen alien spaceships, a dozen. And reportedly, both our government and private aerospace companies are trying to reverse engineer the ships. One source even said, we're trying to fly these ships. Let's bring in Michael Schellenberger, the founder of Public on Substack. Anyways, 
again, you can listen to this. It's on my Twitter handle. Uh, it, you know, they they confirm he confirms all of this. Yes, and and they're doing all of these things. The government is back engineering. By the way, I still have somewhere a VHS tape of Bob Lazar. I don't know if you guys know who Bob Lazar in 1989. He's the guy who told us about Area 51. He said that he was hired to back engineer this craft. That's what a portion of Area 51 was built for that and um, to, to house these ships. And, and then he says that uh, they functioned on something called Isotope 115, which was something and that we don't have in our chemistry tables that folds space so that essentially the way they they travel is they use the gravitation they you know how einstein said that gravity the force of gravity was ripples in the time space continuum so you got like you know a planet uh, falls into an orbit or if you have a sun it creates a ripple in space it folds space and let's say earth gets in the caught of the fold of the sun. That's that's how we're experiencing gravity. It's not a force that goes out like Newton had thought from some central place and binds everything together. So I still 115, Bob Lazar says they're folding space. They're pulling the point they want to go to. They're, they're pulling it towards themselves. Then they're positioning their craft on it and they're releasing it like a slingshot. And it sounded like crazy, but then he, these guys are now coming out I mean, look at 1989. How many years ago is that? That's 33, 34 years ago. 34 years later, we're hearing the same story, right? UFO crashes. Now, look at my documentary that which we released in 2006. Like, what is the biblical, you know, view uh, of all of this? Yeah. This video, captured by NASA, shows two UFOs. It appears one of the UFOs is fired upon as it zooms away. So could, you know, two UFOs crash and they're retrieved. Now, I released this documentary in 2006. Where did I get the idea of looking into UFO crashes? Well, oh, yeah, you, you probably can. I don't know if you can see. I got it from this book partly. Uh, wait, I have this on blur so you can't see it. But basically, um, it is a book that is called Magic Eyes Only, Earth's Encounters with Extraterrestrial Technology. It's written, uh, it was published in 2005 by Ryan Wood, and he signed it for me, November of 2005. And he says exactly the same thing, that they were going around, like Bob Lazar before him, that they, that they were going around and they were retrieving crash technology and back engineering it. It's one of the ways he said that they're giving us this technology. They're crashing it into the earth, you know, because why, how, why would sophisticated, you know, aliens fly through space and somehow crash? Is it pilot error? They, they can't handle the earth's atmosphere. Like what's going on? They were wondering. There was another guy. His name was Bob Lazar. I, I still have a my Bob Lazar VHS tape as well. He, uh, there was a time where when you wanted to interface with the internet, there was a search engine interface called Netscape. And so on Netscape, Bob Lazar was uh, this guy who still is talking, and he had all of these people that who who were high-level government, army officials and all of that, and they were had given him exclusivity to their testimony, and he had put them together, and then he had the first ever internet broadcast where he was going to broadcast the, their testimonies, and, and I recorded it. And so basically, this whole thing about um, um, crashes, there was one guy who was a guest of his, uh, who was one of these 
high level people who had decided to come forward and through Bob Lazar, he said that that's he was part of a department that went around and retrieved these crash sites. That's that was their job. They were they were they would go around and re retrieve the the crashes. And while this whole so this was then this book comes out, you know. So the idea that UFOs crash and technologies, it, it this is not new as part of the story. Um, the overarching story of this phenomenon. So if people are suddenly tuning into it now because it's on the news, it may appear like it's happening now, right? But no, so we have one more guy come forward. It's part of this process where the fallen angels are presenting themselves as modern day aliens. And I want to talk about the nature of the angelic world in a moment. But as all of this news that's coming out, this also came out in the middle of all of this. Um, it was... Um, where did it come? Ah, yeah. Look at On this, May Las 1st, Vegas. When a Las Vegas Metro police officer's body cam catches this, something flashing low in the sky. 911 emergency. Minutes later. There's a, there's like an eight foot person beside it, and another one's inside, and it has big eyes and looking at us, and it's still there. Someone calls 911, reporting two large figures in their backyard. Uh, no, I'm so nervous right now. The 8 News Now investigators obtaining another officer's video as he sent to the Northwest Valley home. I have butterflies, bro. I've only thought of shooting star, then these people say there's aliens in their backyard. By now, it's more than an hour after that bright light, officers meeting up with the caller and his family. What'd you see? It was like a... Like a big creature, a big creature, yeah, like a long 10 feet tall, like a big creature, long 10 feet tall. And I'm going to talk about these creatures. So, suddenly, we all, this thing comes out. Um, on this is June 8th, the Las Vegas is June 8th. Suddenly, June 5th, this article comes out on this tech blog about this guy that says, Hey, I know that the government is retrieving alien ships and there's bodies involved, then three days later, in Las Vegas, lo and behold, some average Joe, you know, some family that is just totally normal, that everyone can believe, has this, this sighting, and not only of a light in the sky, but of actually a 10-foot creature. And when the police go into their homes, they actually turn the their body cams off, citing private property concerns. But the neighbors say there was an SUV going in circles and actually came and retrieved something, right? So it kind of like amplifies the idea that, wow, there's something something going on here, it seems. You know, even though I put this up because Elon Musk tweeted, hey, you can pay 3500 to get augmented reality, or you can pay $20 and buy these psychedelic mushrooms so that you can make contact with UFOs and aliens. It's like it's everywhere suddenly. Um, so, um, this person posted this and I'm not sure if this is actually, um, accurate, but so don't, don't quote me on this one, but and it has to be guys are looking at us and it's still there. Okay. Where is this on your property? Uh, in my backyard. I swear to God, this is not a dope. This is actually weird. So there's, two, of it. So there's two people or two subjects that are in your backyard. Correct. And they're very large. Okay. Like so, so if you if you ever watched my uh, groundbreaking documentary UFOs, Angels, and Gods, you see that the second half is dedicated to the UFO abduction phenomenon and the creation of modern day Nephilim or hybrids. And I have all these uh, images that were drawn by um, uh, actual abductees that was given to me by Dr. Jacobs. And you have to understand that not all of the hybrids look completely human. Some hybrids look human completely, like that one. But others, like this guy here, they don't look completely human, you see? Or the one right here. because Or the one right here. I mean, this is a real thing. If you haven't seen it or if you've never heard of this, I know it sounds crazy and I can't explain it to you because my focus here is going to be on the UFOs themselves and the nature of the angelic world and, and all of that. But the point is that these hybrids that are not completely human looking may be used as part of this theater where they they are the show that they're putting on for us is that the aliens have arrived. And I'm going to explain to you there's a larger context of why 
it led me to believe that this is where we're headed, that they were going to have this show for us. And and it's actually happening. It's the beginnings of this de deception. So first of all, one of the distinguishing differences between our documentary and what later I realized was happening in the States with people who I essentially call the days of Noah people, what they were saying was that, hey, look, the modern day UFO phenomenon, the Lord said it would be like the days of Noah. And we have Chuck Missler say that in the documentary. And we're seeing the modern day UFO phenomenon. It's about, um, um, it's about um, uh, the creation of hybrids. That's the heart of the modern day UFO phenomenon. According to Dr. Jacobs, who I interviewed, the world's foremost abduction researcher, Johnny Mack, you know, the head of psychiatry at Harvard University, um, Bud Hopkins, a great artist, the thing from New York, he, he coined the word hybrids in his book uh, in 1983, I think called Abductions. So basically, um, this was where the empirical research led Christian thinkers who then said, you know what, There's, there may be a connection between this uh, modern day hybrids and the ancient stories of the Nephilim of Genesis chapter six, as well as um, prophecies in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, about the end times, the commingling of seeds. I would also add the parable of wheat and tares. And so basically, uh, these ideas were coming to us independently of, I didn't even know there were people in the States thinking about these things. And so we definitely included all of that in a documentary and really did a Zoom showcase of a modern-day abduction phenomenon and had both Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Chuck Missler, you know, talk about it. But, but that wasn't the only part, you know, what I pray to the Lord. And I said, Lord, if we're really going towards a final deception where the enemy is going to create a perception for all the nations of the world, and I'm going to put that in a documentary, can you give me some biblical evidence? Where has this happened before that, that the enemy has created entire veils of thought? for humans, for human nations. And I see with hindsight that, that the Lord answered that prayer by giving me the hermeneutical key concerning the Elohim, the gods. So the term Elohim is a term that applies both to the God of Israel, but the gods of the nations, like in, let's say, you know, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, God says, I will judge the gods of Egypt when he comes during the Passover, uh, on the night of the Passover, I'm going to judge the Elohim Hamitzchayim, and then this this study, you know, I, I I went over a thousand, close to a thousand verses in the Bible that talked about the word Elohim. Then I remember that Chuck used to talk about Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 and 9 in the Septuagint. And then in 2006, Adela Collins, who was a, you know, a theologian from Yale Seminary, wrote an article in biblical archaeology about that whole concept. And she mentioned that not only in the Septuagint, but also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this was a confirmation. So I, the Lord gave us the hermeneutical key of Elohim. And that was important. The word Elohim applies to the God of Israel, to the angels, fallen and righteous. It just means like spiritual authority. You can think about it that way. It's a term of spiritual authority. And even to the spirits, uh, uh, the disembodied spirits of the, 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 the film, the Shadim, they are even Deuteronomy 32, verse 17. Even they are called Elohim. So, so this this is and God is called the El Elohim, like in Deuteronomy ten seventeen, that God is the El Elohim. If you're not familiar with this concept, because you know there was a time where I had to really try hard to explain all of this, but thank God, you know, God anointed a man in the states, Doctor David Heiser, uh, Michael Heiser. He was a theologian. He he popularized this idea, and because he was part of the seminary system, he brought the credibility that people who are in that world need. And so it made my life easier. I don't I don't have to, to to fight the whole world about this. But this was very important. Why? Because look, this is what I discovered. Psalm 68, verse 1. The chariots of God, Rechev Elohim, are 20,000, even thousands of thousands. The Lord's among them um, in Sinai. And so, and so... Basically, um, um, okay, just give me one second, please. And so basically, this was very important. You see, 
these these what does the word rechev mean? It has been translated into English as chariots, right? And the word rechev, actually, when you look it up in Hebrew, it means vehicle, something that carries you from A to B. The reason it was translated as chariot is because until today, there was no other chariot, no other vehicle, I should say, but a chariot. So the translators thought, well, it's redundant. We're not going to say vehicle. Obviously, it's, let's just say chariot. That's like a place holder for the concept of vehicle, because until the 20th century, there was no other vehicle but a chariot, right? From the days of ancient Mesopotamia, from the days when the sons of Noah settled in the plains of Shinar, all the way to this day, there was no other vehicle. So the old Bibles we have translated Rechev as that. This could be the vehicles of God, and it would be there would be no mistake. I've checked even with modern Hebrew speakers from Israel. They're like, yes. So Rechev Elohim, right? Now the word is Elohim. Now here the word applies to God. But this passage could actually be talking about angels. The chariots of angels are 20,000, even thousands. Because I'll tell you, there's another word that in the Bible talks about the chariot of actually God himself, his throne. And I'm going to show that to you. But bear with me here. So I discovered God gave us the hermeneutical key of Elohim. That's why I put it in the title of the documentary, UFOs, Angels, and Gods. UFOs, well, you know what that is. Angels is Malachim, and Elohim. was the. This was the title of my documentary. I got a lot of slack for it, you know, what I call Christian hate mail, where people are like, no, why didn't you say demons? Well, because that's a different matter. Why didn't you say fallen angels? Well, because that's a term of Christian culture. In the Bible, they're called the Elohim HaGoyim, the, the gods of the nations, or they're called the Bene HaElohim, the sons of God. And so it's important that I, I was, the Lord, the Holy Spirit was leading us into the understanding of the uh, scriptures. And I had to reason from the Bible. I can't, I, can, I, I could care less about Christian tradition or what my uh, brothers and sisters, you know, have inherited from their parents in Europe and before that from the Roman Empire. And now they want to, you know, explain the world through these traditions. My focus was on the Word of God, and I'm sure many of you appreciate that. And so the point that I'm making here is that these vehicles I discovered were associated with the wor world of Elohim. I remember I was on Coast to Coast, uh, and I looked at what they wrote about me, the people at Coast to Coast AM. It's a radio show in the States, and they said, oh, um, you know, Ali Siatan believes that there's a race called Elohim. And I'm like, no, it's not a race. I guess they kind of diminished it, right? But here I discovered that these vehicles were associated with the world of Elohim. And Elohim is a word that applies to God and angels. Good and righteous doesn't matter. The whole enchilada, okay? So, so first of all, the Bible identified this thing, the vehicles of Elohim. And, and we see them operational, not only at Sinai, but we see them also operational in the story of Isaiah, of Elijah, a chariot of fire, Rechev Esh, that's Esh means fire. So Rechev Esh means chariot of fire. And with horse of fire and separated them, him and Elisha. And then he went up in a whirlwind. They kind of turn into a whirlwind, you know. And later, when Elisha receives the mantle from Elijah, because if you see me, you will receive the mantle of my prophetic ministry. Later, Elisha, the student of Elijah, has a student himself. And they're running away from the king of Assyria and the chariots of the king of Assyria, right? So it's like the, the men of the, the, the chariots. It's, it's interesting because it juxtaposes the normal chariots of human cavalry with the angelic chariots. And, and so then they're afraid. And the disciple, the student of Elisha, is afraid. So Elisha prays to God that God open the eyes of his disciple, that he may see that those that are with them are greater than those that are pursuing them. And, and the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, in the mountain full of horses, and chariots of fire, Rechavesh, the same thing that had taken Elijah. There was an angelic army. But the point is, I realized, and this is really the point, that the term vehicle in the Bible was associated with Elohim, 
therefore, I could apply it to the angels of God as well as to the fallen angels. The Bible gave me that permission because the word Elohim applied to the fallen angels who were the gods of the nations. And again, if you're not familiar with this concept, I have many videos where I explain this on my YouTube page and you can look it up. And I'm, I've been on a lot of shows. And of course, there's the 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 work, the incredible work of Dr. Heiser, who explains this in great detail. So basically, that's why I'm not spending so much time. There was a time where just explaining that concept would take the air out of the room. It would take me forever. You know, I, I was literally the only guy, you know, saying, and I had to reason from a Bible that was not in people's hands, you know, an ancient Greek translation, a Dead Sea Scroll. So it was like, it was very hard to make the point that, but it, but it made sense because it combined all of these passages in the Bible, such as Daniel chapter 10, or the, the conversation between Satan and Jesus about these principalities behind the nations, you know, it, and, and also the gods of all these nations. And so... When I looked into these nations, I realized that that once I realized that that the spiritual forces behind them were as real as the spiritual force behind Israel, they were just you know the bad guys, or that they not only had given information, they had given information to the nations, and I'm going to come back to that because it ties into our conversation. Remember, they're re retrieving uh, craft in order to back engineer it, right? like information so they but they also had not only that the gods of the nations had chariots the way that the angels of god did right and so i realized that this is a feature of the angelic world as a whole um and as far as you know why did they crash and these guys were saying it's pilot error others like uh, ryan wood was saying it's a way they're they're actually giving us technology I put in a documentary that what I just showed you, which was they were actually, um, I don't know where it was now, but that they were actually being shot down because there were two opposing forces at war, you see? That's kind of like, you know, what, or what I suggested in my documentary, that there were two opposing forces at war and, and that then I showed a footage... This video, captured by NASA, shows two UFOs. It appears one of the UFOs is fired upon as it zooms away. And, and the reason I'm, I'm, ta I'm ch showing you these passages from the Bible about the Rechav Elohim is because, listen, I've been... I put this documentary out in 2006. Now it's 2023. I've been talking about this and fighting with my brothers and sisters at times, often about some of the concepts in here. Um, so I'm putting this, I'm starting the conversation here because I know that to say that the world of angels, that the angels of God um, involves some sort of a, some, a vehicle of some kind we, we don't really know is a very controversial and people go wow wow what angels need vehicles etc and no wait a second it's interdimensional oh no it's uh, you know blue beam or oh no where did these i'm going to open all that for you don't worry that i'm not in a rush and and you can take the, uh, all the time you need to watch this i'm i'm going to answer all those questions because the deception that's coming, you know, you, you can't understand what's going on if you're not armed properly from scripture. Okay. So the people that said that, you know, the modern day UFO phenomenon is just a demon phenomenon. It's the it's the fallen angels, they're creating hybrids, like the days of Noah, who they created Nephilim. And therefore, that's the UFO phenomenon as a demonic phenomenon. That was the entire revelation they brought forth. We brought something that opened several hermeneutical keys. The, that was given to us by God that opened more concepts in the Bible. So we tied together this existence of the fallen angels throughout the ages as the gods of the nations that the word rechev or vehicle or chariot applied to the entire world of angels and God. They all have it. And that therefore our focus was not the idea that the modern day uh, abduction from non we covered that was just was just a stepping stone in in where we're headed our focus became the final deception 
the second coming itself. So if it's true that the angels of God also have these things, I mean, when, when we think about the nature of the angelic world, where do we get that idea from? Where do we get our ideas from? If they also have these things, then when the Lord returns with an, with an armada of angels, it becomes possible for the Antichrist to cast the Lord as an invading alien and rally the nations behind him, especially if he's got these guys, the ones we, that more and more are, are being introduced to us in the news um, this the you know behind him, but let me let me build this up for you step by step, and they're going to give him gifts. Remember, he makes fire come from the sky, lying wonders. Uh, so how does he do this? Maybe he makes a connection with these guys and says they're behind me. But the nature of the angelic world. Look at this video here. Um, okay, so this is an interesting video. You can watch it. It's called A Shining a Light on the Masterpieces of the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages full series. In, in this great channel, All Out History, if you're a history buff like me, it'll, you know, they make documentaries about history. This one is very interesting, I find. It talks about the influence of pagan art on the nascent Christian religion in Rome. As you all know, Christianity is a Jewish religion that came from Israel. And when Jewish missionaries came finally to Rome, uh, like Paul, um, and, and the Gentiles abandoned the worship of the gods and converted to the Judaism of Jesus Christ and began to worship the God of Israel, they now needed, eventually there was a period of persecution, but then they were allowed to come out of the catacombs after Constantine. And, and now they started to take over the world of art as a way of glorifying a God and teaching biblical concepts. But where were they getting this art from? This guy shows clearly that they were taking ideas from the pagan world, Apollo, you know, and, and Zeus, and even other th things that I'm going to show you. And they were actually, you know, just calling it Christian. They were kind of putting Jesus' uh, figures. Now watch this. Take the halo that miraculous circle of light that you see around the heads of holy figures in Christian art. At first, there were no halos. Jesus was the magician with the wand, and that was enough to differentiate him. But as Christian art grew busier, and more and more characters popped up in it, Jesus needed to look more obviously divine. So Christian artists did what the pagans did. They gave him a halo borrowed once again from Apollo. Long before Jesus acquired his miraculous nimbus of light, Apollo already had one. A circle of symbolic That's sunshine sun sun. emanating from his head to signify his solar divinity. Another crucial borrowing from the pagans was the image of the angel. If you look at a typical Roman sarcophagus of the early Christian era, you'll usually see a pair of winged figures carrying a portrait of the deceased upwards in glory. They look exactly like angels, but they're not. They're Roman figures of victory, Nikes, pagan transporters of the soul. You get that? Nikes. Pagan transporters of the soul. These figures that we see here, um, I need to use my right hand for a second. Religion. So these figures that we, we you know, these, these men or boys with wings, bird-like wings, these predate Christianity. In fact, I would say they go back to Mesopotamia, but that's a different story. They predate, meaning actually they may go back to something real like the seraphim and beings that people were seeing. But for our intents and purposes, these figures go back to pagan Rome. They were called Nikes and they were carriers of the soul to the realm of the gods. Christian artists, you know, the, the Christian bishops and stuff, I guess, they're like, hey, look, we need some angels. 
that we know we're, we're getting this religion from Israel and has these angels, the Malachim, the, which was translated as Angelus. And they're like, well, we don't know, we don't do angels because if you read, let's say, the book of Daniel, and you get to see real angels, or you know, they're very horrifying. People faint at their sight. They're very different than than this. And these artists were like, but we, we know how to make Nikes. We've been doing that for a long time. And I guess the church authorities were like, let's go with that. Everyone will know what we're talking about. We'll just say these are angels. And maybe it was clear to them, you know, meaning that the people that were coming to the basilicas, they also took over this Roman construct where people met for meetings called the basilica. And they turned that into, you know, the church. Um so they thought, okay, maybe maybe even the early Christians, they understood that this was not actually biblical angels, that these were night, but maybe they were not biblically instructed. I mean, not everyone had a Bible in their pockets. Even today, the people have Bibles in their iPhones. I don't know how many people really take deep, deep plunges into the Word of God. So basically, not to make you feel guilty or anything, but I do encourage you to do that. It's a spiritual discipline that's well, you can't live without. It. It's a sword of the spirit against the deceptions. That's what we're talking about here, deceptions. So this perspective that came from pagan art of the Roman angels, um, of, of uh, the, the Nikes, the Roman Nikes, turned into angels in the imagination of early Christians was, was amplified, amplified by the artists uh, that were hired by the Vatican uh, you know, go to the Sistine Chapel, go to the museums of the Vatican in the city of Rome, and you will see, I mean, uh, right now I'm using a book to prop up uh, this laptop, and it's it's all about, you know, art, and it's, it's this uh, Roman art has a rebirth, a renaissance um, in Europe. Italy becomes twice the mother of civilization, not from ancient Rome only, but also the second time in the time of the Renaissance that leads all the way to the 21st century. It comes from the city of Rome one more time. And this time, the Vatican hires all these artists and they create all this art. You go to Rome, you know, there's the statues of angels with these bird-like wings. So the idea that angels are naked men with bird-like wings that came from the Roman concept of the Nike now gets completely embedded in, in the Christian imagination and continues to be expanded with movies. Even like you watch movies, Hollywood movies, Netflix movies and stuff, you see the same thing. You know, some creature descends with these bird-like wings. No one cares. No one even bothers saying, what does the Bible say? Of how do the angels come and go to the earth? Well, lo and behold, the Bible talks about the Rechev Elohim. So for me, it was very simple. The Bible talks about real places, real people, real buildings, uh, not real buildings, real uh, cities, real uh, empires, real characters like Abraham, like Jesus, etc. Um, and, and so I thought to myself, if the Bible is, you know, there's this thing happening out there, and I had a UFO sighting in the deserts of Iran. You can hear my testimony on my YouTube page that led me to all this research, take a deep dive. And so I thought, okay, well, what does the Bible have to say about this very real thing that's out there? And it was in the concept of the Rechev Elohim that I discovered um, the, the the biblical concept, you know, that that, that captured this whole thing. Oh, my laptop's running in a battery. Let me just plug it in. So, so basically, um, it once the Lord showed us what the word Elohim meant, then I was comfortable associating first of all the concept of these vehicles to the world of angels. I mean, look at look at the assumptions we had about angels. For instance, um, there's the angels that come in Genesis chapter 18 and eat with Abraham. The Lord and two angels come and eat with Abraham. Um, there's angels that slay five thousand Assyrians by giving them a plague. There are these angels that are commissioned by God to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. How did they do it? Like, it was, is, does it all happen through mind power? Does God imagine sulfur commanded with His word to fall from the sky, or do these angels arrive? And and I mean, we are of the world of God and angels. We discover the mysteries of the heavens and the earth. We break the atom. We decipher the DNA. We send rockets into the second heaven. Yes, that's what the, the universe is, the second heaven, at least the area outside of us. Some people will place the third heaven as where the Lord exists. 
and the second heaven as the universe. Others see the second heaven as the area where the sun and the moon and, the, uh, and, and just outside the earth, and the third heaven is the rest of the universe all the way to where the Lord is. And I would say that even David calls the heaven of the heavens, you know, the seat of God. So the whole idea that the universe is a modern name of something that already existed, but where did the concept of the universe come from? Because the Bible says we are in the heavens, and, and that word is plural because there are three heavens. Shamaim is the Hebrew, it's plural. Uranus in the New Testament. It means the sky where the birds fly, the vastness of the universe, and, and the temple at the heart of time and space. All of that is called the heavens in the Bible. So it includes the universe. You see, the physical creation is not a bad thing in the Bible. It's called blessed at every turn of the days of creation. Blessed, blessed, blessed. When Jesus comes back from the dead, when the Lord comes back from the dead, he says, come and touch my wounds. Give me food to eat. I'm flesh and bone. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. He makes a point of that because I guess later we see how through Greek thought and Greek philosophy, Gnosticism and, and Hellenized, uh, you know, the Hellenization of Christianity, which is a Hebrew religion, it pours in. And for the Gnostics, the highest form of spirituality was non-physical. So Jesus becomes a spirit, but there's already a spirit version of God. What's called the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. So the Father inhabits eternity. The Son is the visible image of, of God in time and space and in process and sequence. And, and he's carried by a cloud. And we see in the book of Daniel, he arrives to the Ancient of Days in a cloud. What is this cloud? That was his the glory, but what does it look like inside? How does it exactly carry people, right? This is a, a verse that I hadn't queued in, but let's say, for instance, I'll, I'll just use this. Um, let's go to Isaiah. Let's see if I... Give me one second. Okay, so Isaiah 66, and um, I say I have to put the actual verse in. Isaiah 66, verse 15, it's a prophecy of what we would call, again, something that is never called by that in the Bible, the second coming, we call it. In the Bible, it's called the great and terrible day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. So for behold, Yahweh with, will, with fire will come and, with, and like a whirlwind with his chariots. So the Lord, Yahweh is often a term as translated as Lord in our English Bibles, the Lord will come with fire, like a whirlwind, with his chariots. Wow, even God has this thing. But the word is Merkeba. The word is different. Merke, Merkebota here it says. But it's the word, the singular is Merkeba. And what it means, this Merkeba, is that it's, it's a term. I know there's a mystical Kabbalistic view of it that carries the soul to the realm of God or you know, maybe through the Holy Spirit you can send, you know, because Paul says, I knew a man uh, who had been caught up into the third heaven. I don't know in body or spirit, he says. So you can go in spirit, but you can also, like Elijah or like Enoch, go in body. And if the, you go in body, then you need Rechev. And so God has a Merkeba. And what is that word? It comes from the same root word as Rechev. It means also, that's why it's also translated as chariot, because the translator is like, oh, this is the same word, basically. It kind of means carriage. Perhaps what Ezekiel saw on the shores of the river Chebar, as mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 1, was indeed this whole thing, this, this Merkava of God. And so um, this, the Lord comes and... And you might say, well, why does God need this? Obviously, God doesn't. God can do anything he wants. And that's my whole argument. People tend to put God in a box, but they think if they put God in a lofty big box, like God would never use this, angels would never use these things, that, that they've made or done everybody a favor. 
All you've done is create a box that appears big to you and put God into it. The truth is you have to let go of putting God in any box. The answer is God can do anything he wants, right? If God chooses to manifest himself in the time and space on a flying throne, are you going to say, no, wait, my concept of God has been Hellenized. He's a spiritual, magical being. But in the Bible, he comes back from the dead. He points to his physical nature. He ascends in a cloud. He comes back with an army of angels. And as I clearly showed you, the angels have these chariots, these vehicles, this Rechev. You know, in modern day Israel, when they wanted to create trains, they, they had to draw from this word, Rechev, because there was no trains in, in, in the Hebrew language because they, they were relearning Hebrew from the Bible and there was no train. So they went to this word of all the words in the Bible, and they said, oh, this means vehicle. And they imagined the word train, rikvat, which means wagons, a, a vehicles attached to each other to pull a person. Okay, They took from that word. So this was what differentiated, one of the things that differentiated what we brought to the, to the Think Again Productions brought in 2006, which absolutely this documentary went viral. People were calling me from the entire world. Um. And what the days of Noah, people who I love and cherish and they have grand great work, but but there was a difference. They were focusing only on the UFO phenomenon as something that was bad because it was a redo of the stories of the sons of God from the days of the flood. And for and the whole idea of our angels interdimensional, intergalactic, physical, non-physical, magical, all of that was kind of left nebulous. Just the term interdimensional satisfied everybody because it it hearkened back to this concept. Um, when the the world was Hellenized, um, it and the Bible was spiritualized and then allegorized by Origen and Saint Augustine. It means that everything became a symbol. It's not really talking about the universe, the earth, real nations, real people, real prophecies. It's all symbols of something greater. There was other things that came later in Christian history and that I think might be, take too long, but, I, but basically the physical was seen as profane, meaning that the physical world was seen as a place of sin rather than as the creation of God. And gradually Christians started to gravitate towards a ghostly realm they called the spiritual world. The fact that the universe and the earth was the handiwork of God, that we were the descendants of the one made in the image of God, that the Holy Spirit dwelt among us as we stand here, and that the Son of God, the visible image of the Godhead, had come back to life as a man, and he was the son of King David, a Judean, a Jew, and the Jew sits on the throne of the universe. I know that's not popular because there is so much latent anti-Semitism and overt anti-Semitism in the churches, including the Protestant churches, and that that it seems very, you know, we just focus on the divinity of Jesus rather than on his humanity. But he's the son of God and the son of David. And that's what Gabriel says to Mary, to Miriam, that your son will reign on the throne, will receive the throne of his father David and rule over Jacob, right? It's clear about that. So so this idea that that the universe is more something we should just forget about becomes something that slowly takes root in Christian thought. And by the time we get to the rise of the age of enlightenment and, and science and atheism and all of these things, uh, what we start to see is that is that the, the scientists start to tell us that we should only focus on the material world that they define with with you know fire and water and air and 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 you know height and width and these substances and 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 the christians say but no by through faith we see a, a spiritual world and and so the angels and god become magical creatures of that world rather than beings that inhabit the, the creation in, meaning the universe and the earth and whatever else is the, is out there and and so there was kind of a distortion about the nature of angels they are at the end of the day they're part of the created order they're bound by laws like we are um when you look at the lord himself he chooses to come to earth as a man and stand at the at the end of roman whips preach on the ships uh, boats of galilean fishermen who basically fished on what is a lake to north american standards you know when i first visited israel the tour guide said 
if this was in Canada, it wouldn't even be on a map. It's true. It's like you, know, you can swim from one side of uh, to the other. So, uh, but it's just located in a place where mountains are all around it, and the winds can gather and storms can happen. Um, so basically, um, there was a distortion concerning the world of angels. They were spiritualized, uh, uh, and they were made non-physical, even though, I don't know, you look at the stories of the angels in the Bible, we see angels eat food with Abraham. We see them appear to uh, Lot, and the men of Sodom want to have sexual relations with them because they're probably used to doing that. We see angels, fallen angels, be it, but still angels, you know, share their DNA with humans and create hybrid offsprings throughout the ages, including the modern times. Uh, then we go ahead and look at um, other passages like the uh, angel that sat in the tomb of Jesus. Now, why does the scripture say he sat on it? Because probably for the same reason the Lord said, come and touch my wounds and give me fish to eat, because God knew that there would be this spiritualization that would happen in the future. Then we see uh, let's say uh, the book of Hebrews says that some have entertained angels unawares, right? So be hospitable. Now people say, oh, well, angels, they, they they take a human clothing just to interact with us. They come from another dimension. And for a moment, they put on human clothing just to say hi to us. And then they go back up and they become these, you know, spirits that live in a ghostly magical world. And I'm like, great, show that to me in the Bible then we'll talk about it. But for now, what the Bible actually says is that they leave the earth through these vehicles, okay? I know it's hard to take. It's a lot to take because it seems like, what am I saying? I'm saying that much of what you understand from angels comes from Christian tradition and from the mindset of generations who were not called by God, by holy God, to focus on angels, on the study of angels. It's assumptions handed down from one generation to the other. But now that we are at the eve of the second coming, which is a war of angels, God is removing the veil and showing us and saying, behold, so look at the true nature. So for me, I realized that in the Bible, the angels had characteristics when it came to these vehicles that matched what I was seeing over my head. So now I could say, wow, one more time, the Bible speaks of an actual real thing. And now I can see why the second coming is going to be uh, possible for the enemy to cast it as an alien thing. Because once they, you know, all of these uh, Copernicus, Galileo, Francis Bacon, Newton, all of them involved in mystery, religions, um, in, in Masonic uh, rituals and things like that. I mean, Newton was an important mason, Galileo as well. These guys removed the biblical notion of the heavens and they created for us a new way of understanding uh, this black starry thing. They called it the universe and it's a place of gases, uh, of rocks, of hydrogen, of atoms, and we can you know, study it uh, empirically with our human reason in mind and measure it and maybe over the course of thousands of centuries and millions of years maybe we'll understand what this thing is but the bible already had an explanation for it, what it was the scroll of the heavens is rolled out by god and there's the host of the heavens which are these this whole beings uh the elohim they're called you know in christian traditions it's it's we, we reduced them to to their function as a messenger, angelus. But in the Bible, that's the term for them. And then there is the, the host of the earth, which is Adam, us. So there's the host of the heavens and the host of the earth. And then there is the heavens and there's the earth. There was already an explanation. They come and go in these chariots. So this is all very clear what this thing is and why do the gods of the ancient the gods of the ancient world have these chariots because they were the fallen angels and they had it and the gods and the and the angels of god have it it says it right here in 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 the book of um i in in psalm 68 verse 17 in the second kings about elijah and elisha even the lord it says in isaiah 66 15 comes back with one of these so so if you take the lord and put him at the end of roman whips that's okay but if you put him in the heavens and the universe and beyond in the middle of his angels and their chariots, oh, now you've done everybody a great blasphemy. I don't understand this line of reasoning personally. So this was a very significant difference between the perspective that we presented to this conversation and what the days of Noah people were presenting because they did not have 
the hermeneutic key Elohim. So they saw the UFO phenomenon as simply an evil thing, which was the 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 redo of the days of the flood, because the Lord had said it would be like the days of Noah. And I 100% agree with that. And that's why I put it in the documentary. And that's why I have Dr. Jacobs explaining it. But this was a subcategory of a larger paradigm in which it's important first and foremost to understand that these vehicles are, are a hallmark of the world of God and angels and man because we are of their world. And then a group is acting this and the, the deception is deep. It's not just about the creation of hybrids. There is more to the deception. I'm going to show that to you right now. And that this is leading to a final galactic, cosmic, you know, spiritual battle, whatever name you want to give it, because as I said, the physical world is the spiritual world. Uh, we are in, in, in the handiwork, in the ingenious creation, the unfathomable, complex creation of God. As we sit right here, we, the sons of Adam, the daughters of Eve, we, the bearers of the spirit of the very God of the creation, the Holy Spirit, we, among whom the Son of God has walked and will return with an armada of angels, this place is already very spiritual as it is. It is this, this spiritualization process, this the influence of hell and Gnosticism and other things that slowly over time made the physical world something that Christians kind of poo-poo at. They go, oh, you know, there's a more magical place. Sure, but the creation, I'm sure, is endless in complexity. But this place is not such a shabby place. It's certainly not too shabby a place for it to be the setting of the story of the Bible. And so the concept of angels comes from Roman art, is amplified by the Vatican and by cinema. The biblical concept of angels is already a lot more in harmony with this phenomenon. So this phenomenon is recorded by the ancestors, the gods of the, uh, you know, Von Donneken wrote a book, The Chariot of the Gods. You know, It's mentioned in the Bible, uh, and, and they're not aliens because we're not in the universe, we are in the biblical heavens. All of these things have been created by God. These beings, like us, are involved in the kingdom of God in a giant story. And the Bible sheds light on, on the, the fact that, that there's a portion that has rebelled against God. And so the, the UFOs, in a way, unlocked for me the angelic world of the Bible. And then the world, word of God informed me of the story of the war, of the divisions, and how it had gotten to this point in time, and prophetically where it was going. And that's what I put in the documentary, UFOs, Angels, and Gods. If you haven't seen it, watch it. And by the way, please share. Share the documentary. Share this a video that I'm you're listening to right now if you have find value and share it aggressively you know because I I see now how important this information is now that I see the deception taking shape you know we all have families kids friends we want people to know what's going on and I'm going to open the deception to you right now I just wanted to present the overarching umbrella perspective that the difference for us and the days of no is that for us first and foremost the 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 concept of these chariots applies to both if you will the angels of god and the fallen angels okay and angels in the bible are presented as physical beings and i'm sure that there there are many that are angels that are creatures of light the really high ones you know they have gamma ray bodies you know that's what the bible says the nachash the serpent you know there's implications of the word light in his name the shining one, you know, the so the seraphim. So, so, the, but that doesn't mean that they're outside of process and sequence. That outside of, they actually have to move in time and do things and say things or think things and learn things. Or doesn't mean any of that. It just means that they have a different body, like the one that the Lord demonstrated, the transfiguration, the one we will receive eventually in the heavenly Jerusalem. Because when he comes back, we'll get new bodies. But I'm sure we're going to continue to rule with him for a thousand years on the earth. So eventually, you know, so there, but that doesn't mean that the angels are outside of the creation itself, like God is, that they're outside of restrictions, that they don't have limits, that they don't operate within a certain body of knowledge. Because when you look at the book of Enoch, where the angels first appear, they give knowledge to the children of Cain to the children of, of Adam and Eve and as a whole eventually. Um, and what we see is that the knowledge that they give, so first of all, Cain builds a city for his, and he calls it according to the name of his son, which means that he had the knowledge of geometry and architecture. And we see that his line 
He talks about music, metallurgy, uh, like Tubal Cain, tent dwelling. And these are knowledges that were all perverse, according to Jewish uh, scholars, the, the rabbis, and so that they were all used. The metallurgy was to create idols. The music was to create worship to the to what we would in Christianity call fallen angels. But again, they're called the Bene Elohim in the Bible. Learn the proper biblical terms. The term fallen angel, the concept is in the Bible, but the term is nowhere in the Bible. In the Bible, they're called the Bene Elohim and the Elohim HaGoyim, the sons of God, Bene Elohim, and the gods of the nations, Elohim HaGoyim. So, uh, so basically, the sons of God, these fallen angels, they were teaching humanity who was able to receive this information because we are ourselves of the world of God and angels, which means that we are able to learn what we would call in our culture, science, architecture, laws, music. We have a knack. We have an understanding, a genetic, a spirit, whatever you want it is. We have a way of learning these things. And our world is founded on these bodies of knowledge, the civilizations that we have, all the way from the earliest civilization of Mesopotamia that Noah's children created, already all of the bodies of knowledge, uh, whether it's architecture, mathematics, medicine, literature, uh, religion, music, um, kingship, all of these things that are foundational to the world already existed then, and they exist now, because we are their children and we live in the same world. So what we see in the Book of Enoch is that these fallen angels decided to pervert these bodies of knowledge for the sake of creating a world in the image of their pref preferred way of being. And so Azazel teaches um, men to make swords, knives, shields, and breastplates. And the sword is the only weapon used uh, not for farming. The other weapons of farming are used for war you know, throughout the ages before industrialization. But the sword was always created to kill man. He teaches military arts and the creation of armies and weaponry. And how to for women to make themselves beautiful through makeup so impiety increases and fornication multiplies another one of these guys teaches the the solutions of sorcery which means pharmakeia right that's the greek word for sorcery the dividers of roots um the observers of the stars um the the motion of the moon so the kind of information that these guys were giving was what we would call today science and this was the makeup of an occult religious system by the way um it the understanding of god's creation has always been the most coveted type of information so these angels this showed me when i read this you know i read this i think in 1996 for the first time and i was like wow are you telling me that these the angels actually operate in these bodies of knowledge that we operate in, but they know more about it because they have been around longer, because they're wiser, they're older. So, so I started to see the angels as beings that knew more about the laws of creation than we did. But we could learn with time and maybe even surpass them, right, in understanding of how God's creation operates and is put together, right? So... The whole point I'm trying to make is, again, the world of angels is different in reality through the evidence that we have, because the book of Enoch is quoted by Jude as scripture. And so the 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 way that we understand, you know, the world of angels, it's different from the way it actually is. And the way it is, it's 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 like this information, you know, they they come after the flood as the gods and they give this information as the basis of civilization, the way that God speaks information into the Jewish world through the Bible and through the prophets of Israel and, and through the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he creates, you know, a world born of the teachings that come from him. The angels also do the same. Um, and this carries us all the way to the 20th century. Um, look at the Nazis, for instance, you know, Hitler uses science to conceive, test, and in some cases deploy a fascinating and frightening series of firsts. From highly advanced long-range ballistic missiles to jet fighters, the first to enter the war, said to overpower the Allies' propeller-driven aircraft. 
to an early stealth-designed monoplane straight out of Star Wars, decades ahead of America's B-2 stealth bomber. Even so, the Nazis start to create V-2 rockets when the American rocket system is in its infancy. These guys are already creating rockets that can hit England from Germany. They start to create jets. They create the, the Nazis, like in the middle of this war, like they suddenly, okay, you know, let's just, okay, let's create rockets. Wow, they're efficient. Well, let's go. You know, the, the, uh, the, the Von Braun, these guys, they come in the States and, and, and the Soviets and the Americans take these scientists. And that's how they become technologically, they, 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 they take the technology that comes to, to these Nazis. They're, they create, you know, jets, the first jets. They create things that look like B-2 bombers in the 1940s, right? It's like, where did they get this? Now, if you look at the Nazis, you'll see that, that they come from a movement that began of spiritualism where gates were open, where where they were there were mediums, they were connecting to spirits, and 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 there was a massive spiritual change that came over Germany, and eventually the 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 being the people that were really into the occult of it needed a guide or Führer in German to 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 crystallize and bring to fruition their view of the world. And they what did they do? They killed the Jews because there was there was the Holocaust, the tragedy of the Holocaust. They were coming to fulfill Bible prophecy and lead them as the prophecies fulfilled, the entire world is blessed because we enter the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of Yeshua HaMashiach. So the, the enemy used this in order to stop them and to kill them, to break the word of God and destroy prophecy that leads to the redemption of the world. And of course, you do have to have a heart for the Jewish people, not just see them as some sort of a you know building block in your prophetic model. There are people, real people, who are under a lot of pressure by the enemy because their destruction would destroy the prophetic word. And so that to protect them, I think, and to and to stand up for Israel and for them is, I think, is a must actually of uh, of a walk of a person who's embraced the Jewish Messiah and the God of Israel and has calls the Hebrew Scriptures his own. Right. Um, so you look at this. Um... To this end, Nazi dream machines include the Falkwolf rotary jet with liquid fueled rockets at the tips of its triple propellers designed to take off vertically, then fly like a plane. But the most incredible vertical lift weapon of all is thought to be hidden in the secret hangars at Penamunda. A Nazi UFO. An article in German news magazine Der Spiegel later reveals the secret invention Rudolf Schriever plans for the SS from neighboring Czechoslovakia. The piloted Schriever Flugkreisel. Nearly 50 feet in diameter, with three impulse jets on a rotor inside a circular fuselage. This UFO was never built. But further. So, where did the Nazis get all this incredible information? Well, when you look at this idea that we have entered the days of Noah, as the Lord says it, because you see in the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, there's all of these uh, historical ages that are recorded. You know, the, the story of Exodus, the story of Noah the story of Antiochus Epiphanes, and, ma and many other stories. Rabbis say the reason these exist in there is because every generation lives in one of the ages of biblical history and must understand which one. So when the Lord was asked to talk about the end of the age and what it would be like, it was natural for him to take one of the ages of biblical history and say it will be like this one. Matt, it's not the only age that applies to the end times. The story of the Exodus definitely applies to the end times, and as well as the story of the abomination of desolation mentioned by the Lord himself, which takes us to the age of Antiochus Epiphany. So there are several ages of the Bible that apply to the end times to give us the complete picture, right? But let's focus on the days of Noah. So in the days of Noah, it wasn't just about the creation of hybrids. It was the giving of knowledge to humanity that made humanity very advanced. 
the pre-flood civilization became very advanced. And even after the flood, Nimrod finds some of these writings. And I don't know what these guys were building that could reach heaven. I don't know. Was it just a ziggurat? Was it just a temple of clay? Was there more to it? I don't know. But perhaps there was more to it. So knowledge, the giving of knowledge is part of one of the hallmarks of the days of Noah. And knowledge was, has been given by the fallen angels to humanity. Once I understood that the gods were real, and I looked at what they had given to humanity, you know, I've, I, you can, I just did, did an interview with Derek Gilbert you can watch uh, called The Religion of the Gods, you know, where I explained that, that they gave, you know, whether it's Hinduism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Zoroastrianism, whether it's uh, the Vedic text, there was, they gave knowledge. Uh, the Egyptian Book of the Dead, the Enuma Elish, they gave knowledge to humanity. At the heart of this knowledge was the knowledge to worship them. But they gave the knowledge all kinds of pieces of information. Look at the uh, libraries of Mesopotamia, of ancient Iraq, the cradle of human civilization, where Noah and his sons settled, according to the Bible, eventually, and rebuilt civilization. In those libraries, we have so many tablets that tell us that this information this was given handed down to them, and this is information that applies to architecture, how to build incredibly advanced temples, um, science and mathematics, advanced mathematics, astro astronomy, math that is used for for space. I mean, you know, so many things. You know, they divide the circle in three hundred and sixty degrees. That's where we get that from the mesopotamians did because six was their magical uh, celestial number everything was to the power of six like ours is to the power of 10 and so they they divided the circle in 360 and they gave us the whole concept of hours and minutes and seconds that we still use to this day they came up with the with the time measurement system that we use and so um the the whole idea that, that these ancients were primitive is, 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 a, is a myth of the Darwinists who keep trying to tell us that we had primitive origins. No, we had very advanced origins because from the beginning, we were created by God. And so these beings are not visiting our world. They, they have given us the algorithms of knowledge that has created civilization. But who are these beings that we're seeing in these chariots, these heavenly crafts? It's God and his angels, some righteous and some fallen, but you know, God is on his way, mainly the angels. And yes, I do agree that most of the angels, most of the UFOs that we're seeing above us and all of this charade that they're trying to rebrand as aliens is definitely the fallen angels. So most of the UFO phenomenon is the fallen angels. But the angels of God are here as well. They're protecting Israel. Maybe they stopped nuclear war between Russia and uh, America. I don't know what they're doing but definitely this phenomenon so is the hallmark of the fallen angels so come the 20th century as as there is this idea that israel is going to return to the land um we start to see that there's a ramp up the alien abductions are as old as the uh, end of the 19th century and we see the industrial revolution and we are now according to carl schwab of the wef we are now in the fourth stage of the Industrial Revolution that he calls the Digital Revolution, where he says man and machine will melt together. It's like, you know, who comes up with this stuff? Basically, the Industrial Revolution kicks in, and and from there, um, we, we start to uh, move forward in knowledge exponentially. Like for thousands of years, we're farming, everything, and then suddenly we go like that. Off we go. So this is a hallmark of this um, days of Noah, that they're not only just giving us the, the recreating hybrids. You know, um, you know. Again, see the documentary that I've created, and you'll you'll see the details. Not only are they creating hybrids, but they're also giving us knowledge. Why are they giving us knowledge? Well, once. The, the 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 scientists that were inside of these mystery schools and stuff in, in you know let's say between let's say the 1200 and the 1800 they gave birth to the concept of the universe darwin's evolution hypothesis allowed them to plant the idea of the alien in our heads 
the way that we evolved here, somebody else evolved elsewhere. And now they're visiting the earth. And of course, the angels, they're magical beings with feather wings that live in a spiritual ghostly realm. And they're multidimensional magical beings. So on one hand, the church's idea of angels gets, boom, they start to think this way about them. They get, get they're distorted. On the other idea, the, the, on the other side, the idea of the universe is introduced to us and it's inhabited with these quote-unquote Darwinian aliens. But this is all just distortion. We've never been in the universe. We're in the heavens and on the earth. This is the host of the heavens. We're the host of the earth. We're in a story. God, you know, came after the Tower of Babel, gave the nation into the hand of these beings, chose Jacob for himself, sent his son, and through his son came the gospel and the Holy Spirit that delivered people from the worship of these beings of the gods who and and you know their chariots and then god brought uh allowed the final empire to re-emerge uh, an empire of the fallen angels at the time where israel becomes a nation and we head to the second coming for and there's reasons for this you can read in the bible and other reasons we don't know about it's beyond what god has chosen to reveal to us but this is the story so we know what's going on and then suddenly we get to this point here and these guys appear in 1947 on mass the same year that israel becomes a nation in october is it or november 1947 the united nations league of nations says yes israel is an official nation has a legal right and uh, to exist as a country and then we see uh 1948 they move into the land and, and well they're already in land but they really become a country officially and then we see the same year 1947 the ufo phenomenon appears and now people are like, what's all this? Well, now we, we have been secularized. The, the secular veil is now in place over our heads from these mystery schools, from these secret societies who have rebranded the same way that the Islamic veil is in place in other parts of the world or the Hindu veil or whatever other veil. Here, it's the secular veil. And in the secular veil, our, when our eyes look at these beings, this stuff, we go, oh, aliens. And then the church has deflected our attention concerning angels. They're completely very different, have nothing to do with any of this. But then the Bible comes to the rescue and says, guys, remove the distortions. You already know who these beings are because they have always been part of the story of your of humanity. They've, since the Garden of Eden, they've been with us. They've been over the nations. They've been coming and going. And the Lord and his angels are on the way. And by the way, in the Bible, the angels have vehicles. So we now know what's going on. That's what I learned. That's what led to the making of the documentary. So the idea that we decipher, decoded the word Rechev Elohim, the, the chariots of God, but the, the word Elohim also means angels, fallen and righteous, the gods of the nations or the angels of God. And this these vehicles is associated with the whole enchilada. This changed our perspective. Okay, so there's a larger paradigm. The angels of God, they have this. And now some of them have rebelled against God, and some of them are are cre recreating the days of Noah as God had prophesied, and that's why most of them. And so, so it's like okay, so most of them that we see here are fallen angels. They're mo's. They're creating hybrids. That's why we had such a leap forward in technology. They're giving us information. Um, there's like you know, uh, so so basically. There's there's a large story here. The nature of the world of angels is a lot more like the reality of the UFO phenomena in the Bible. Um, the um, where this is all going is into a great deception. So let's talk about a bit of that deception. But before we go to the deception, I want to share uh, two other things with you that um, you might find interesting. So the same way that the Nazis had these, you know. Uh, templates for creating these things you look at for instance the um ancient vimanas which are you know from the hindu texts there there's even entire texts in hindu writings uh dedicated to to uh how to build these ancient things there's actual like ancient sanskrit writings which have like measurements and how do you create these you know, this is stylized, the chariots of the gods. Even I can show you Italian painters painting the chariot of Elijah looks exactly like one of these horse-drawn chariots, right? Because this is how they had to do it. But when you look at the ancient writings, there's an entire uh, Sanskrit text dedicated to the vimanas, to the vehicles of these guys. 
So that's a, a you know. So this is not not only the Nazis had these templates, but ancient people had them as well. And and you look at, for instance, um, um, the modern day abduction phenomenon. So, you know, the they're why are they making big giants? Why are they creating hybrids? By the way, these beings are very you know very common. The ones the big eyes and the 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 telepathic. They they look at you straight in the eye like this. And they get information. So why are they trying to appear as though they're not giants anymore? Well, there is a, there is a deception happening. And as early as, let's say, 1947, um, I read in, 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 in my research when I was looking into uh, what was going on with the modern-day UFO phenomenon, um, I, I learned that early on, uh, like for instance, um, it says here that what what do the UFOs want? Because they appear in 1947. This is part of the show, right? So once you understand they've always been here, that the nature of the world of angels involved this. By the way, I'm not trying to say that, you know, the angels are like Captain James T. Kirk. Not at all. I don't even know what the inside of these things looks like. I don't know the building blocks of God's, you know, incredible creation. I don't know the different types of angels and how they operate in all of this. It's not at all possible for me to any, know of any, any of these things. If it, like Elijah or Enoch, I'm taking one, I'll sure come back and make a video for you. But for now, my focus is the word of God. That's the only thing that I'm focused on. And in the word of God, what I see is that these things are mentioned. And they're called the chariots of Elohim, the Rechev Elohim. And I see that they're here over our head. So I see that, you know, we're not imagining this. This is not, we're not projecting it. We have arrived to the gates of the second coming and the Lord is removing the veil and showing us the true nature of the world of angels and how this thing is going to go down. There is going to be a war, right? There's going to be a war. So um, let's talk about the deception and the war and we'll finish with that. Basically, uh, like here it says early on they're wondering what these things what are these things and what have they come that was the very problem was addressed in february of 1949 by astronomer professor george valley acting as a member of the air force scientific advisory board in a top secret report he said the pentagon his theories about the alien civilization that might well be coming to the earth this is his theory in 1949 to a pentagon board such a civilization might observe that on Earth we now have atomic bombs and are fast developing rockets. In view of the past history of mankind, they should be alarmed. We should therefore expect at this time level to behold such vegetations. We've made nuclear bombs. We're dangerous. They've come to, to before we enter into the galactic community. They're telling us to put our warlike ways away. And I put in the documentary a poster of the movie called the day the earth stood still and i've seen even other people are talking about this but recent the thinkers so it looks like we all come to the same conclusions which is a confirmation from god i find because this is important if we're explaining where all this is going in in that movie the day the earth stood still the thing was released in 1951 or 52 it talks about how this alien comes to the earth bearing the same message so the idea is that they're here to civilize us, to help us with our problems. The environment is a big one. They keep talking about it. There's John Mack, the head of psychiatry from Harvard University. He went down to Africa to in a private school. Uh, I think it was Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, to investigate this alien sightings that had happened in the courtyard of the school. And one of the kids says, you know, uh, we really have to take care of the environment. And he says to him, where did this idea come to you? Did you have this idea before it came from them? And she says, no, it came from them. He said, she says he, he had big black eyes. And when he looked at me, like I had this idea. So they're putting this idea that they're the saviors. You know, these, these, there's environmental shifts. And for all we know, they're creating all of this. I mean, look at, look at what's going on, but it's part of the propaganda of presenting themselves as the saviors of the world. So the fallen angels are rebranding. They rebranded the earth, the uh, the universe, the heavens of God's Bible as the universe of the secular mind. 
They then create a concept of the alien, the centuries in the making. Then now they reappear in the same time where Israel becomes a nation and prophecy of end times begins to be fulfilled. The the birth pang portion, the, the very end of the birth times where this age of history gives birth to the messianic kingdom, to the next age. They appear in the same time and they rebrand themselves as though they've just arrived, like they haven't been here over the nations. They haven't been here since the beginning. They are rebranding themselves as aliens. And they are going to perhaps, you know, this is the idea of the documentary that I made, that they're going to rebrand the Lord and his angels. So first you have to understand that, that yes, we're seeing these UFOs and stuff, but there are many levels to the world of angels. And yes, it's possible the world of angels has always had some sort of technology, but we don't want to turn it into James D. Kirk. We want to understand, we don't know, what, we don't know the true nature of it. It's a bit of a mystery. It's a bit of a mystery until we know, until we see them come, the Lord and his armada, and they set up a kingdom on earth. When you're in the millennial kingdom of Jesus and you're in Australia serving him and he calls you to Jerusalem, how do you think you're going to get there? Are you going to just go through a portal? Are you going to fly? Would it make you feel better if you went through a portal than if you went on a hovercraft and went through the oceans that God has created? That's not good enough for you. You're like, no, it's going to be portals. It's going to be magic. It's going to be, I don't know. What I'm trying to tell you is that you don't know and I don't know. So, so the I, the the inherited uh, idea of angels and and how they operate from the Middle Ages is one thing that's come to the colonists through Europe, and from the Greeks to the Romans, uh, and it's been mixed with the religion of the Jews, and it's gone through all kinds of stuff with the Middle Ages and the Age of Enlightenment that's led and with art, Roman art, and all. Put all that aside. Let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about what we're seeing outside of the window. So the nature, this is this is this other dimension. We've never been alone. This phenomenon is this phenomenon the Bible calls Elohim and the Rechav Elohim. Then the Bible says, yes, but the ones that are making the hybrids, the ones that are lying, the ones that are not glorifying God, test every spirit. The ones that are beginning to begin to present themselves as the as the antichristus, the pseudo-Christ, the saviors of mankind, the pseudo-saviors. These guys. They're the fallen ones, yes. And the good guys are on their way, yes. And some of them are here, yes. But the nature of the world of angels is what I'm talking about, is different than what we had ever imagined before. So we don't want to turn the angels into magical spiritual ghosts, and we don't want to turn them into James T. Kirk. We just want to acknowledge that these things are real in the Bible. They are spoken by even in the pagan literature of the nations, and they're now over our heads that God is removing the veil of how the world of angels, what the way world of angels looks like, you see. So that they, they are deceiving the world by starting to, to put on a show, the fallen angels are, that they're the modern day aliens, they're here to rescue and save us, they give us, that's why I this idea that technology is being retrieved, it ties into the idea that the Antichrist is going to do lying signs and wonders and make fire come from the sky. And even in the book of Daniel, it says the little horn who becomes this boastful king, boastful mouth, makes war with the angels and with the saints of heaven and with God. How does he do it, guys? It says that he even throws angels, stars down to the earth. How does he do this war? Remember what I showed you in my documentary? This NASA footage from a Columbia shuttle, I think it was 1994, was scrutinized to death because the Columbia shuttle had these videos on, has cameras on it that, you know, um, uh, that basically captured um, footage. And, and suddenly that's what this is. They captured these things, this of two things shooting at each other. One is leaving the earth and the other, boom, shoots at it and misses. Now, this is not human stuff. This is angelic. So you have to let go of kind of the older way of looking at things. Understand that the nature of the world of angels is different than what we had ever thought. That they're part of the created order. Not turn it too much into 20th century tech because that's ridiculous. But not also turn it into... And, and now... All of this stuff that's being back engineered or they're giving us technology. Why are they giving us technology? Is it just to endear themselves to us? No. Because look what it says in Psalms chapter 2. 
the nations, the kings of the world gathered to battle against God Almighty and against his Messiah. So does Joel chapter 3. So does Zechariah chapter 14. So does Revelation chapter 19. God comes with his armies. And so it's like, look at Zechariah 14. You know, it's it says Zechariah. Actually, let's open a new window just in case we want to come back to that. Zechariah 14. So um, I'm not too big on the NIV, but that's just me. Chuck Mister should say, are you NIV positive? So let's let's take another version just for um okay. It doesn't really matter. I mean there are many great versions. Um let's go with the TLV. It has a it has a Hebrew. Oh, what did I just do? Okay, here it is. So in the, it says that behold, a day of Adonai of Lord is coming. Oh, I, I will gather all the nations since Jerusalem. And that's, that can only happen since 1967 to wage war. And then the Lord, it says that he comes and his mount, his, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which, so he is sent, he descends from the, on the same mountain where he ascended. By the way, I'm going to Israel December 1st to 10th. If you want to join the trip. Email me at info at thinkagainproductions.com and I'll send you the information. It's going to be incredible. We're going to go right here to the Mount of Olives and you see where the Lord ascended, where he's going to descend. And then it says that um, the enemies that come against Jerusalem, now this is the plague. The Lord will strike all the people. Their flesh will rot while they're standing in their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouth. It will happen in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. So the enemies of Jerusalem, this is going to happen to them. They're going to they're going to evaporate. Going to, their flesh will rot and while they're standing on their feet. Their eyes will rot on their sockets and their tongue and their mouths will rot. And so have you ever had a nuclear blast, the radiation from it? Now you're telling me that the angels of God and God, that when they come, how come there's going to be a war? How can there be a war with God? Now look at the story of Daniel chapter 10. An angel comes from heaven, and this angel that comes from heaven to bring a, a message to the prophet Daniel as an answer to his prayer, a message of scriptural importance. Okay, He gets to the earth, but the prince of Persia withstands him for 21 days. The principality uh, you know, that's behind the Persian empire stands him for 21 days. And to the point he's to call back for backup, and he calls for backup. Michael comes to fight the Prince of Persia so that this angel is freed to deliver this message that this, this principality was trying to stop the angel from delivering. A message of scriptural importance for all the generations and all the nations to behold. Their power was matched. The Prince of Persia was able to withstand for 21 days this angel. And the angel had to call for backup. So their power was matched. So if God comes with his armada, and these guys that are on the earth that we're seeing now coming out of the woodworks and presenting themselves in this new uh, lie, they were the gods to our ancestors, and they now present themselves as aliens to us. If the power was not matched, there would be no war. Now, of course, God is can can I do believe that God can really snap his fingers and all, everyone dies. I do believe that. I believe that all of the creation is just not even even if I say it's a dust at the feet of God, I it's too much. You know, it's even less than the dust at the feet of God. I believe that. But I and I believe that God has chosen to enter his, in his creation, have a relationship with the beings that are in it, not only us, but these other guys too, the angels, you would say in Christian tradition. So basically. This is God's choice to allow this to play out. But his angels are part of the created order, and the fallen ones were once also part of this kingdom of God. So this, this is possible that this knowledge they're giving us, this technology that they're giving us, like the ones that they gave to the Nazis, is to prepare us for the battle of the day of the Lord Almighty. Not us, I mean me, but the kings of the earth that will rally behind him. So more and more... We're going to see these guys come out of the woodwork more. They're giving us technology to back engineer so we can get ready for this battle. 
So this final battle is going to look very different, I think, once it's upon us than anything that the previous generations of the church of the faithful had ever imagined. So this was a very big point. This is a big point that's different from us in the days of Noah because we understood the word Rechev Elohim. Therefore, we applied this term to the entire phenomenon as a whole, good and bad angels. That's why in the beginning of the documentary, it says, is the UFO phenomenon the evidence of the angelic reality, meaning all of them, good and bad. And then we focused on saying, these are the bad guys. They presented themselves as gods over the nations. They're now presenting themselves as aliens. And one of their MOs is that they create Nephilim in order to create the serpent seed. And by the way, the Lord's angels are in his way. And this is how the deception takes shape. They invented the concept of aliens, and now they're going to cast both the angels of God and the fallen angels as aliens and reverse the roles. They are the good guys, and they're the pseudo-saviors, and they're behind the world leader, and the angels of God are the bad ones. This is where it's going. And so if they're, they're coming on the news now to deceive people and say, look, oh, the aliens have arrived. This has been going on since 1947. The whole idea that the good guys are here, the crashes are happening soon enough. We're going to hear one guy come and say, oh, they're having, they're here to save us from, they're going to give us a, like Bob Lazar, or not Bob Lazar, the um, Stephen Greer says, oh, they're going to give us uh, things to help us clean uh, salt water into drinking water at, at, a, at basically no cost. So they're going to give us gifts and toys, maybe. They're going to endear themselves to people. They're going to appear like the good guys. And finally, when the war leader comes to power and he makes a connection with them, who's going to go against them? And when the Lord and his angels appear and he says, these are the bad guys. They gave you religion, God forbid. They gave you rules. They gave you commandments. They want to subjugate you. We give you freedom. We give you knowledge. You can do whatever you want. Why go on the top of the mountain and receive the Ten Commandments when you can say, stay here at the foot of the hill and you know worship uh, Baal and, 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 and have all the fun you want? indulge and we'll give you knowledge. I mean, isn't that what the Masons say that Satan was the good guy because he, he wanted to give humanity knowledge, the tree of knowledge of the knowledge of good and evil, but, but the God of the Jews stopped him. He's the God, the God of Israel is the bad guy. They reversed the entire thing. So this is, this is a theme that runs through history that runs through the UFO phenomenon, this, the pseudo Christ, the, the save pseudo savior. And yes, there is an exchange of technology because perhaps there are, not only trying to endear themselves to us, but they're trying to prepare us for the battle of the day of all. Why? Because the nature of the world of angels, maybe it's very different than what we had ever imagined before. See? So, as I said, the, you know, this book that I got in 2005, Ryan Woods, who's already saying that they're giving, there's crash sites. There was a guy in uh, Stephen Greer's people that were saying, look, there's a, there's a, there, we, I'm the head of a unit. I'm a sergeant. He said that I go around and I collect the stuff and I clean it up. And why are they giving us technology? Why are they even crashing? Well, I put in the documentary as a theory, perhaps there's a war because I found this NASA footage of them shooting at each other. That's why they're crashing. And yes, technology is handed over to us. Why? Because they want to endear themselves to us? Perhaps no, because this is how they're getting us to go forward in our technology. Why? Because they're preparing us for the fulfillment of the prophecies of the great battle coming. So if you hear on the news that aliens have arrived, don't be deceived because we've already understood that this is the hallmark of the fallen angels. If you hear the technology is being handed down, it's true perhaps because that is part of the days of Noah and that's what we've seen with the Industrial Revolution, that, that suddenly in the time of the, when the prophecies of the end times are coming true, the two world wars, you know, the first one freed the land from the, of Israel from the Ottoman Empire. The second one gave it to the Jews. And the third world war, is the one in which the Lord himself will interfere, the Prince of Peace, and stop it and start the new kingdom. So this period of history that we're in is the period where the appearance of these beings, of the massive advance in technology, of the creation of these hybrids. And now, you know, we used to think, oh, they were creating hybrids and eliminating them until they found the ones that were, you know, if you watch my documentary, they create, levels of hybrids until they, they create the ones that are exactly human looking to infiltrate the culture. And But now that we see this footage of people, of hybrids, of walking in the backyard of people that look a little bit more rough and alien-like, 
it looks like they're using some of the other hybrids as part of the show that aliens have arrived. Look, we'll show them a pilot. You know, we'll give them some technology. We endear ourselves. We, you know, we yes, we're connected with the governments. They already know about us. You know, especially the American government, the most important one. They're putting into place the machinery of the deception. Soon they will present themselves as the saviors of the world and rally the world against the second coming of Christ. But the nature of the angelic world is very different the way it's described in the Bible and the way it was imagined by the church. And the veil is being removed and we're seeing the cosmic battle because the world of men and angels is becoming more and more melted together. When when the Lord is a, a, creates his new kingdom on earth, we will openly be in connection with these beings, with the angels of God. And we will benefit from the increased knowledge that comes, the wholesome knowledge from God. And we were designed to receive like Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that we can comprehend it. We were designed by God to be able to receive more information about the building blocks of how his creation operates and for us to be able to operate in it. Is not a tree a technology? Is not the human body a technology that carries our soul, our spirit? Is not the donkey that he rode on a technology or the ship of the fisherman that he sat on is not the chariot that carries the angels of technology. So is it so, is it so impossible to think that, you know, the world of God, what is technology? Nothing more than organizing God's creation according to an understanding. Taking the building blocks of what God has created and putting it together according to an understanding. You can build, you know, a little airplane out of paper or you can build an ancient Mesopotamian temple out of advanced math. You can build a rocket ship that goes into the second heavens. By the way, look at the modern day uh, space program. It's got the occult all over it. Um, you've got the Apollo missions, the son of Zeus, and now we have the Artemis program. You know, you you look at the Sputnik, the first Russian satellite. It went up on the Day of Atonement, which is also the Day of Judgment, the biblical day, an appointed day. This is preparing us. If they do actually build a base in the moon, when it says the moon will turn into blood, I wonder if it's because the Lord's angels have come and they start shooting things. I don't know. But the point is that um, we don't want to turn it into Star Trek, but but it looks like there is the world of God and angels, and our world is a, is a poor mirror of the world of God and angels, of course. But it seems that, you know, when like Moses, when he was told to build the menorah and other features of the, the, the tent of meeting, God says to Moses, I'm going to show you heavenly things and I want you to build a human, you know, replica of it. And so that's in the Bible in several places, in Exodus, Book of Numbers. So so this, in a way, we are, we have, we are like an echo, a, a lower echo. You know, we have created ships to, to carry the oceans, and God gave Noah the template of how to build a giant ship. Well, he gave templates how to build temples. So, yes, we were just rudimentary throwing these little rockets into the second heaven. The first heaven is the sky, and we already made planes to fly into that. We're doing these things because I think this is an echo of the world of angels, but a much more primitive version of it. So, so this is really the Lord is unveiling. So this is modern day UFO phenomenon, because um, the idea of the universe and of Darwin and, and aliens is was created for us as a thought veil, and replaced the truth we always knew because we were God's creatures and God gave us His Word to explain the creation to us. We don't need to be deceived. We have. These beings, like it says in the documentary at the beginning, you know, these beings have been a constant of human history, and now they're just putting on an alien show for us. And yes, they're giving us technology to prepare us for the war. They're they're in creating, giving us knowledge. They're creating social change. You know, the 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 types of social change we're seeing happen. This is all the days of Noah. The days of Noah wasn't just the days of hybrids. It was the days of Nephilim kings. There's going to be Nephilim kings, 10 of them, we're told in the book of Daniel. And one of them is the seed of serpent himself. And now we can take the parables of wheat and tares and the seed of the God and the seed of the serpent very literally, it seems to me, even though there may be more meaning to those things. 
And we're headed for this battle. And it's very concrete and it's happening right before our eyes. So these guys, don't be fooled. This is a lie that they're aliens. They're not. Because we're in the heavens and on the earth. They're the fallen angels and they're posing as aliens. This is their MO. And they're going to start to deceive the world, present themselves as saviors, give us gifts and technology, and rally the world against the second coming. So this is a time where you want to focus on the hope from above. Because all of these things are telling us that the great kingdom of God, the powerful kingdom of God, or all of these things is under control. We don't need to be afraid. You know, all of it is under control. God is much more powerful. Evil has limits and bounds to its influence and power. And these are the signs of the times pointing to the coming, the second coming of the Lord and the establishment of his kingdom on earth. Pledge your allegiance to the King of Kings. Receive his Holy Spirit. Walk in his ways and live in the expectation of his coming. Receive the joy and peace and goodness that comes from God. The light that comes from his scriptures. And don't be deceived by the rise of this phenomenon that is a show, like the Truman Show. It looks like they just appear. They're like, oh, what's all this? Oh, they're giving us technology by crashing us? Yes, I am an army officer. I have top secret clearance. I'm telling you, it's all real. And the government pretends like, yeah, we don't know about this, but it doesn't really deny it. And everyone goes, whoa, it looks real. And so people are being sucked into the concept of the alien and the deception. Don't be. And tell people about this. Share this. This We've always known what this is. The nature of the world of angels in the Bible involves the vehicles of the angels. It involves this. So please, this was very different in a way, the, the, the message that we brought. So please sh watch the documentary and share it. Watch this video and share it if you find merit in it as a way of inoculating people against deception and the great coming lie. So these are the fallen angels. They're present. They're pretending to be aliens. They're influencing the world by giving it technology, by infiltrating it with hybrids, by choosing leaders. Eventually, Satan would give his power to one of these hybrids who will be his seed. And that doesn't mean he's from the modern day abduction phenomena. He could be from the old bloodlines. If you don't know about that, there has been ancient hybrids that, have, that whose bloodlines have continued through history. And this is what the parable of wheat and tares is about. And the Lord and his armies are coming to the earth and there's going to be a final cosmic war. And the reason there can be a war is because these guys are going to probably build us up, the war of angels and men. And, and of course, the Lord is on a whole other scale and it's going to shut all this down. And he has you know knowledge and weapons that these guys don't even understand. And he's going to bring in an age of peace. So we are on the cusp, despite the earth's problems, we are on the cusp of entering a utopia. And you can be a part of it because this information, the Bible talked about these events in such an age. And you can inherit eternal life and have a new body in that kingdom and be with God who loves you for all the ages of history. And serve him face to face. The earth is the incubation chamber of the sons of God and the daughters of God, the children of God, the immortal children of God. That is the purpose of this planet. And we have a role to play in the temple of the heart of time and space, in the heavenly Jerusalem, in the new heavens and the new earth. As the servants of God, as the sons of God, over the created order, the angels and, and, and these beings. And yes, it involves process and sequence, meaning there's time, things happen through sequence and process. There are laws, the laws of God's creation, and we are all operating in it, okay? So this is not new. It is not unknown by the saints of God, by the Kiddushim. It is not unknown by the scripture of God, and God has gone ahead of us through ministries like mine to prepare the church for this rising deception, okay? So please understand what's going on and share it. Do not be deceived and focus, dwell not on the dark and evil, but focus on the hope of God that comes from above and is present in our lives daily. And and him, his armada is, is, is coming to save us, the calories on its way. And all of this is under control. 
This is a time of the testing of the hearts of men, the sifting of humanity. Truth and deception are allowed to travel far and wide and let men's hearts be revealed. Which is it? Will you pledge allegiance to the King of Kings, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, or to the Caesar of this world, whoever he will be? This is the day of such a test. What is in the hearts of men? Who is your king? Which side of the fence are you on in this cosmic tale? Right? So life and death is before us. Right? So focus on the joy and on the peace. You know, be with the good stuff. Let the blessing flow in your life and share. So what, if you want to be, if this is the first time you're hearing all of this, there's a YouTube channel, subscribe and, and put the bell on apparently. That's, you get notifications. I have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash thinkagain uh, productions, Think Again productions, uh, where you, I'm doing a series on the book of Revelation, an audio series. You can support my ministry by monthly donation. You can watch the documentary on this YouTube page. If you go to my website, thinkagainproductions.com, you can watch the documentary. And if you're moved, please put a, go to the donate button, button at the bottom and leave a donation. It's a free, but you know, I have bills, we have bills and it helps me do this work. So, you know, you can do that as a recurring thing through PayPal, through the donate button. You can join the the um, Patreon page, or you can just do a one-time donation. Um, you can go to the website and sign up for the newsletter. Stay informed. It says thinkagainproductions.com. Both my Facebook and Twitter handle is at UFOs, Angels, Gods, one word. But watch and share these things. I think it's important, especially in this day and age where all of this is happening before us. God bless you all. Till next time. Bye-bye. This was Ali Sieratan from Think Again Productions.com.